one of the things I really want to do more of is demonstrating how I use SD-WAN technologies in day-to-day -day work, right? And uh, what I'd like to do is show you how I've used SD-WAN uh, in the last couple of days to solve a real world problem. And that problem was a, uh, a customer of ours who was complaining that their Wi-Fi wasn't working. Now, these guys live a long way away from me. It's, it's 10 hours to get there and back. Um, and through the usual kind of process of fault finding, we're over the phone and, uh, and also using in control two to have a look at, um, what devices were online and what weren't, it became fairly obvious fairly quickly that the most likely cause of the problem was some power line adapters that we'd use to extend the network within the customer's home uh, to where they needed the Google Wi-Fi mesh access points to be. Um, now, when I looked at that, I realized that the only way I could know for sure that it was a power line issue was to actually run the power line, um, the, the manufacturer's tool that they have to um, to monitor the, the health of the power line modules and the, and the bandwidth between the modules. Um, but I could only run that locally. Uh, that's only something that works when connected directly to the local network and you can run it on a Windows laptop and off you go. So what I needed was a way to change the networking to enable me to run that tool, right? So let's just have a closer look at the customer network. This is how it was all laid out. And what we've got here is a public balance one uh, acting as the, the, the default gateway for the network. And on the WAN of that, we've got a pair of BR1s and they're connected to EE and Vodafone and they're doing uh, enabling the balance one to do bandwidth bonding and load balancing of traffic. And then hanging off of that network are um, a bunch of IP cameras and a network video recorder. And that was one of the main reasons why we were called to this particular customer location in the first place. It's because they were on really poor DSL. They had no upload and the customer wanted to be able to view CCTV remotely. And whilst we were there, uh, they asked if we'd fix the Wi-Fi. And so we did that pretty well actually using a Google um, Mesh Wi-Fi system. So there's actually there's five APs, uh, Google Mesh APs. And the way they, these things work, you provide one of the uh, APs with inter access and then the rest of the APs it become a wireless mesh and you, it meant, it's meant to distribute Wi-Fi around the house. Um, the house uh, where they, these, this equipment is installed is very old, thick Yorkshire stone. It's had recent modifications, so there's quite a lot of insulations, foil-backed insulation, that type of thing. So Wi-Fi is a real challenge there. And to get that Google Mesh into where we need, thought we needed it to be, we used some TP-Link power lines, right? Really good product, actually. We used them a lot in the past, never really had much of a problem with them. And um, this version of it, the PA9020, uh, is like it's rated for 2,000 megabit on really clean um, power lines. Uh, it's got this tool which you can run locally, which uh, is obviously what I want to use. Um, but it, they aren't manageable remotely. It's a layer two device, right? It doesn't have an IP address that you can access, um, no web interface that you can access remotely. It's all... Um, a proprietary protocol, proprietary utility has to be run locally. So how can I get get myself into a situation where I'm sat here in my, uh, you know, my home office, and I can pull out a laptop, plug it into something, and be connected to that cu uh, customer network at layer two. So this is the plan. Um, the plan is to create a, uh, a layer two SD-WAN connection between the customer's router and a router I'm gonna have here on the workbench behind me. And the plan will be for that to be at layer two, so when I plug my laptop in, run the utility, I can talk to and see the remote power lines and find out what's going on. Um, and there's a couple of challenges with this. So the if you remember, if we go back to the customer network, 
the BR1s on the WAN, they, they're on dynamic IP, so it's behind carrier grade NAT. So um, those BR1s get private IP addressing and um, and the balance one obviously gets private IP addressing from the BR1s as well. Um, and in my environment here, the BR1 I'm gonna to use to, to, to remotely connect is behind NAT as well. It's behind my um, existing NAT router. So there's gonna be a bit of fiddling to make this work. Um, and what I'd like to do is actually walk through the stages of config for this and show you how to make it work, right? Okay, so what we're looking at here uh, on the left, the left window, we've got the um, balance one, which is at the customer site. And uh, in the right window, we've got the BR1 that's on the workbench behind me. Now, first of all, I'd like to point out that I'm accessing these via in control two. Okay, so I've logged into in control two. I have um, gone to setting, found the device, gone to settings, remote web admin. And here we are, uh, that's the result of that, of running remote web admin. I've now got easy access to the web interface um, without needing any sort of port forwarding to get to this web interface or anything like that, right? Uh, so straight away, really dead easy to get to the devices to do this level of config on. So the first thing I'm going to do is set up a profile, uh, a VPN profile on the customer router. So let's um, let's dive into that and do that straight away. So uh, network pet VPN. We're going to do a new profile. Uh, there's a profile there already because um, remember this is set up for remote access to CCTV, and um, and we're doing that via Fusion Hub. Uh, so there's a public IP held in a Fusion Hub appliance that the customer uses to access their MVR. Uh, maybe I'll do a video about that another time. Let me know if you're interested in that um, and I'll, I'll consider it. But right now what we want to do is we want to create a profile on the customer's router that connects to the BR1 behind me. So um, let me just go into uh, the BR1 and look at the local ID. Uh, the local ID here is set to cloud case and then the cloud case serial number, which you're using. So straight away, I can paste that into the remote ID of the for the profile here. We'll just give it a name while we're connecting to a, a slingshot cloud case, slingshot six cloud case. And then uh, it's asking for the remote IP. Well, I've in, in control two, I've actually got the uh, peplink DNS service running for this box. So I know I can uh, do this, uh, which will resolve to the WAN interface of my network here, um, which of course is no good yet because we're gonna have to do some port forwarding on my network to get through to this device. Um, and we'll do that in, a, in just a moment. So we've got, given it a name, given it the remote ID, it knows what the remote uh, host is that the so this remote balance can come and talk to the BR1. The only other thing we're going to do at this stage is change the default ports that PET VPN uses to to create the tunnel. Um, the reason for that is that my existing gateway here on my network is already using um, it's already got VPN tunnels up to other locations. So ports 4500 and uh, 32015 are already in use, right, by the by my perimeter gateway uh, device. So I need to use a different uh, set of IPs. So I'm gonna use a custom data port. So instead of 4,500, uh, let's use 4,600. And then I also want to use a custom handshake port. So I can click on the question mark here, click there and change the handshake port. And I'm gonna, let's just increment by one uh, so it's easy to remember. So 32016, right? Um, and that is that profile set up. So if I click save there, uh, and in a minute I'll click apply, but before I do, I'm just gonna grab um, the local ID from there. And uh, and whilst we're here on the, on the BR1, I'm gonna quickly set up the, um, uh, the 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 VPN profile on the BL1 to receive this inbound VPN connection. So, uh, customer router, uh, remote ID, 
Now it's on a custom data port, so I'm going to replicate that here, 4,600. Um, and that's all I have to do there. Click Save. Now on both devices, I need to create the layer two component of this. So if I go into network and network settings on the customer router, I've got a, a, a single data network set up. That's the 192.168.77.1 uh, network. And what I want to do is turn that into a layer two bridge network over VPN. So here are my two profiles, uh, existing profiles. That's the Fusion Hub one, and here's the Cloud Case one I just made. So I'm going to click on that one, um, and I'm not going to override anything here on this device. I'm going to leave it, um, leave it all as it was set up before. I don't want anything else to change there. Um, I'm just going to click Save on that. So now uh, we have. Uh, set up the profile in that box we have told it to be a layer 2 connection uh, and we're finished on this customer device we're just going to click apply changes uh, so that that gets set up and um, and what we'll see on the dashboard is the new pet VPN profile appear and that it's trying to start that VPN so let's come across to the BR1 uh, we need to do the similar thing. We need to go into network and uh, enable that profile we've set up here to be a layer two profile. So same deal. Um, I'm going to choose layer two. Not, uh, we'll have the IP address of this router. It was at 192.168.50.1. We'll tell it to set it uh, by DHCP. So what will happen is when the VPN connects, the IP address of this router will actually change to be a 192.168.77 dot something that uh, IP address because it's going to pick that up from the remote device over the VPN. We'll see that in a minute. Uh, click save on that and then I'm going to click apply changes. Uh, and we'll make sure those go through which they have. So now we've got the customer balance uh, router uh, ready and trying to set up a VPN tunnel to the BR1 which is sat behind me and uh, that won't work at the moment because we've got my default gateway here on my network in the way and we haven't opened up any ports on that so let's go and do that quickly so I've got another tab here um, and this tab is my default gateway here so what I'm going to do now is just set up some port forwarding rules uh, so we're going into network port forwarding we need two ports to uh, open up the tunnel between the customer router and the BR1. Uh, the first one is the handshake port. So if you remember, uh, we set that to an increment um, uh, of the, the standard port. The standard port's on 32015 and we set it to 32106. I want uh, both of my WANs to forward that port. so. I'm taking both those IP addresses and uh, I know that the IP address uh, of the uh, the BR1 is 101260 76 so uh, I'm going to click save on that so that's the handshake port um, and then I also need the actual data to come through the tunnel itself now we set that port rather than 4500 we set that to 4600 uh, again, I want that on both WANs, like that, um, and it's going to the same IP address, the IP address of the BR1, 10.12.60.76. Um, uh, so those, that's the two ports. Uh, it's not TCP, it's UDP for the data port, although in firmware 8 uh, there's now the option to, s to select TCP, I think, which is interesting uh, I need to play with that so going to click apply changes on there let's jump back to the BR1 and it's worth whilst we're here just pointing out how did I know uh, what the IP address of this cloud case uh, was set to well of course if I hit details next to the WAN port I can see 10 12 60 76 there um, and if I were to jump back onto the gateway go to status 
client list, uh, then I can see a full list of connected clients here and we can look out for the kind of case, there it is, 10, 12, 60, 76. And you'll notice that the button to tag it with a DHCP re reservation isn't there and that's because I, um, I've already tagged it. So I've reserved the IP address to make this demo just a little bit easier. Uh, so uh, we've opened up the ports, we've forwarded handshake and data through. So we're just keeping an eye now on the um, on the status of this tunnel. And what we should see is on the next cycle of the remote device looking to connect, uh, the traffic should get through fine. But of course, like all good demos, uh, nothing has goes straight to plan. So I can give you an impromptu kind of view here of how do we fault find uh, Speed Fusion. Okay, so right now it's saying starting uh, and we're not seeing any attempt to authenticate. We're certainly not seeing any attempt to update routes. Uh, so with since authentication isn't happening, we know that the handshake, uh, the initiation hasn't happened. So let's go back and look at the ports on the on the firewall or on my gateway and make sure I haven't made a mistake there. Oh, inbound port forwarding, uh, 32016 TCP. No, that's right, and it's going to the right address. Um, so let's just make sure that on the BL1, I've actually told the BL1 to use that port for, as the handshake port. And it doesn't look like I have. Uh, so we need to customize the handshake port, set that to a custom, 32016, there we go. Save that, and apply. Okay. So with any luck, once that has applied, uh, the customer's balance We'll start a cycle again to uh, to try and build the VPN tunnel, and this time uh, the BL1 behind me will be listening on the right port for that incoming communication, and we should see the tunnel start to build. Okay, so keeping an eye on the left here, um, we've got starting shown both left and right bit of a spike of CPU as it starts the conversation. Come on, we can do it. There we go, we've got creating tunnels going on. Uh, so it's authenticated. And we're now in the process where the tunnel creation is happening. Um, so we're moments away from that establishing as we'd hope it would. And we've now got established. Great. So we've now built that layer two tunnel from uh, the customer site to uh, the BL1 set behind me. So let me get a camera. Let's go and have a look at the, look at the BL1 back there. And then uh, let's get this out this utility running and see what the devil's going on. Okay, so what we've got in front of us uh, here is the BR1 that we've been configuring. That's in one of our cloud cases. Um, and uh, next to that, we've got the laptop. Um, and the laptop at the moment isn't plugged into the BR1, which we're going to do in a second. But on the laptop, we can see the, uh, the TP-Link application. Uh, and it's not connecting to uh, those remote power lines. So let me just um, grab a network cable here. And let's plug in uh, the laptop to um, to the BR1, and let's see what happens. So that's plugged in. Uh, first thing, of course, we want to check is that the uh, is what IP address it's got. Oh, look! Even before I needed to do that, uh, bang straight away. Uh, the three power line adapters have appeared uh, and I've got, I've got full visibility of that. We can see good bandwidth, 655 megabits between 
the utility room where all of the network network equipment is and um, and the snug which has the Google Wi-Fi mesh there and we've got 473 megabits between the utility room and the uh, Sony TV which is in the other room so that's worked very well um, but I will just show you uh, the IP addressing here IP config uh, so as you can see we've picked up a 192.168.77.37 address uh, which is exactly what we expect we're now uh, very cleanly and very tidily on that remote customer network um, yeah there we go okay so let's summarize uh, where we got to with that it only took us a few minutes to get a layer 2 VPN set up between the two devices one of which remember is hundreds of miles away from me the other one is behind me on the workbench but actually it it too could have been anywhere right because we did it all with remote access tools um so that's great i didn't have to drive to the customer site uh today or uh, in fact yesterday when it happened um i managed to access those power lines see uh what was going on and then advise the customer what to do next and got them back online, right? Uh, for me, this is really the power of these SD-WAN technologies is the ability to create uh, complex topologies and relationships between devices very quickly, very easily, really, you know, compared to how it used to be and then use that capability to enhance the service that you're delivering, the remote support that you're delivering, or the, the in this case, our um, Wi-Fi without wires service that we do. It's also worth noting that that layer two um, configuration, we could extend that anywhere. We, it is effectively like taking a long ethernet cable, um, uh, the world's longest ethernet cable, and connecting two routers anywhere in the world together on layer two. I mean, how cool is that? Um, and some of the things you ought to think about is how you might be able to use that uh, for your customers and your services. There are still a large number, um, particularly in, in industrial networking um, and also in the VoIP world, there's a large number of devices out there that don't really understand layer three haven't ever really been designed to work at layer three don't really get routing and expect to all be on the same network segment well with this layer two vpn capability uh, there's nothing to stop you from deploying a, a layer two network across multiple locations across countries and across continents it's a very very cool thing um and i hope you found uh, this video interesting if you've got any questions about what you've seen in this video uh, if you want me to uh, do a video about anything in particular drop me a line let me know love to hear from you thank you very much